what do we know about the way to let emotion out and through? Mm -hmm. And what do we know about healthy adaptive compartmentalization mm -hmm. as skills? Mm -hmm. And here I'm hoping that perhaps people can glean some tools like take an hour a day and let it wail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take two hours a day and handle your stuff. Yeah. I think it is helpful to remember that emotions are actually the output. They're the product. It isn't so much that we have to figure out how to deal with emotions, although I will come back and say that differently in a moment. We have to figure out how to handle what physical and mental state resulted in those emotions. So what I mean by that is if you are in a moment where everything in your body is in protest, you are amped up and you can't sit still, then working with your body, right? Maybe you are the person who needs to go for a run every day where that hasn't really been who you were before, right? Uh, on the other hand, maybe you're the person who needs to develop a yoga practice to figure out how to breathe through that amped up feeling and soothe yourself, physically soothe yourself so that you can bring your heart rate down, right? So those are two entirely different behaviors, but I can tell you at the end of either of them, your body's going to be in a different state, and I bet your emotions are in a different state too, right? So there's one way to think about it, which is coming at how do we handle the emotions, but there's another way to come at it, which is how do I handle all of the demands and resources I have when demands and resources get out of balance, that stress. So how do I increase the resources in my life? How do I reduce the demands in my life? Because I am suddenly in a really difficult situation. So that's one way to think about it. We did an intervention study in my lab with widows and widowers where one arm uh, received mindfulness training, another arm received progressive muscle relaxation, which is sort of like learning a really fancy body scan. You contract and relax different muscle groups in your body, and you become aware of what that feels like to really understand what relaxation feels like. And then there was a weightless control group. And we did it because the progressive muscle relaxation was the control group. We thought mindfulness training would be very helpful. Turns out mindfulness training was helpful, but progressive muscle relaxation was even more helpful for people's grief. So what does this practice look like? It's a, it's a you're tensing your fists, then relaxing, then Correct. forearms, then so working through uh, head to toe, mm -hmm. contracting for about how long? I'm just trying to get the rough contour. Yeah, of it. it's a brief contraction. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, you can go online. There's really easy instructions. It's often done with a sort of guided mm -hmm. uh, audio um, to help you figure out. But the important part is also feeling what what's the difference between my clenched fist and my relaxed fist? Oh, gosh, I didn't even realize I was had so much muscle tension, right? So what's fascinating is people told us in any situation, I'm in the grocery store, I'm in a work meeting, I'm trying to fall asleep, I can use this tool now to help my body to get into a different state. And that helps my grief. Now, mindfulness training was effective, but not as effective, as I said. And I think some of this is that we had, you know, grieving is a form of learning. I'm not kidding about that. Your brain is busy <laughs> while you are grieving. And it might not be the right time to take up a new practice that requires a lot of concentration. If you do mindfulness, it can be very helpful. Anyway, the upshot of all that is, on the one hand, it's not that we have to deal with emotions because they are an output. We have to deal with our demands and our resources and uh, developing a whole toolkit of ways to think about adapting in our life now. On the other hand, even specifically for waves of grief, having a toolkit of what to do with those emotions, I think you described it beautifully, Andrew, that we do have the capacity for suppression. 
And if you are about to walk into a pitch meeting, suppression is probably the way to go in that moment where suddenly your deceased child has popped into your head and thinking, I am not going to think about this right now. I am completely going to pretend this has not happened and I'm going to do this pitch, right? But if it's your only strategy, then you don't have the learning process going on, right? That at another moment, you might be looking through a photo album and just be overcome with tears, but over time realize, I can't say stay in that puddle either. When I'm doing this, I need to, you know, if it was me, I need to text my sister and tell her, you know, I'm looking at photos of mom and this is what I'm thinking about. And she'll text me some funny story about mom or or even just say, oh, man, I feel you. And if my sister isn't available, then I'll text my best friend, right? Because in that moment, it is important to have that puddle. It's also important to know how to get out of the puddle again. And so this is really a process of learning. How do I cope with these waves of grief? It's like being a basketball player. One possession after another, after another. How am I going to get through this possession? Each possession looks different. How am I going to get through this possession with this constellation? What's the right skill to use right now? 